All right, so it is three o'clock. Um, so you are at the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education, specifically the main IDEA support team, um, office hours. And today we're going to be talking about alternate assessment. I am Leora Byers. I am on the federal monitoring team. And with me today is Jody Basio Smith. Can you come along on and say hello, Jody? Sure. Hi, everyone. For those of you I haven't connected with before, I'm Jody. I am currently serving as the State Director of Assessment, I'm also currently serving as the Interim Coordinator for Alternate Assessments. So it's nice to be here. Thank you. All right, and here is the rest of the team. Colette, can you come on and say hello, please? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thanks for jumping on again with us. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the Federal Programs Coordinator with the Aussie team. All right, then there's me, Jennifer. Hello, I am Jennifer Gleason, and I am on the team with Leora and Colette. I believe you have someone else there with you, Jennifer Gleason. And I have our mascot, Rue, <laughs> he's here. He's, he's Roo! been out the few days saying, hi, Rue. <laughs> okay, Carly, that's a hard act to follow. You want to come along and say hello? <laughs> I know. No one can follow that, right? I'm Carly Thibodeau. I am a part of the supervision and monitoring team, and I joined the team in July. Awesome. Thank you. And Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I am the admin support for this fabulous team. All right. Thank you, guys. So today we have some learning objectives. We are going to talk about the 1%, so that the alternate assessment. Why is it capped at 1% and what for? Jody's going to come on in a minute and she's going to talk about the federal legislation that's behind um, the alternate assessment. We're going to talk about the participation guidelines, learner characteristics, and we're going to talk about IEP considerations. Um, and we do have a couple of examples um, of documenting uh, compliant alternate assessment stuff in the IEP. Uh, we're gonna talk about the assessment design and experience, and then there will be time for questions. Um, we do have contact information again at the end, and you'll see our additional resources that we, um, we put in all of our PD to make sure that everybody knows and has access to what we're doing. So uh, the procedural manual, if you are looking for alternate assessment information, it is on pages 29 to 31 of the manual. Although I would caution you that some of the information regarding the alternate assessment has been updated and there are links in the procedural manual that may not still work. So we're gonna get on that and try to work on that soon. Jody, do you want me to do these couple of slides or do you want to come on and talk about these two? Sure, you can do them. Perfect. Okay, so this is the calendar for 21, 20, for 22-23. So you can see that the assessment name, MSAA, that's why you're here, uh, multi-state alternate assessment. So the content area of reading and mathematics, the dates are 313 to 428. Those are grades three to eight and the third year of high school. And the MSAA science um, will be... Which is in science, not which reading is in mathematics. Science, <laughs> not reading in mathematics. That's fantastic. Will be the same window. And that's also grades three to eight in the third year of high school. So we need to do a quick correction, Leora. Um, yes, we do. Because that is an error. So... Everyone, we're going to do the MSAA science row again. So this, again, is in the content area of science. It is the same administration dates as MSAA and reading and math, but it's only administered in grades five, eight, and the third year of high school. So oh, fewer right. grades than reading and math. Let me just make a note because, okay, thank you. I will make sure that that is updated. Okay, but there's also some other assessments um, that our kids may participate in here and there. Um, of course, not if they take the alternate, because if they take the alternate, they take the alternate. So that is the NUIA. Um, and the window for that 
Oh, the optional window is actually open right now until mm -hmm. next week, it looks like, until February 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the main through year assessment. That window starts 5-1 and goes until 5-26, and that is grades 3 to 8 in the second year of high school. And that is the assessment that is replacing the MEA, correct, Jody? So when we say MEA, we're actually referring to main educational assessments. And so that's all the assessments. Okay. So that includes alternate, it includes general, it includes assessments for English learners. Um, so the main through your assessment is what is replacing the current map, map growth. Um, and for everyone's information, as you know, 99% or, or more students participate in that assessment with or without accommodations. Um, and there are multiple professional learning sessions going on right now around the transition to the main through your assessment. So please feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you would like, if you have any questions or, or would like to get more information about PD. Perfect, thank you, Jody. And then there's the main science, which has the same window as the main through, pardon me, it does not. It is 515 to 526, um, yes. grades five, eight and third year of high school. So Jody often comes to director's meeting and she shared some information um, at the last director's meeting she was at last week, um, specific to the test coordinator and test administrator user guides. Those have been posted to the MDOE MSAA web pages. Um, and there is a test coordinator training scheduled for February 27th um, and a test administrator training scheduled for March 1st. Um, and there is is, I believe, Jody, you said that it takes 30 seconds to fill out this survey. 30 seconds or less. I think the record is 17 seconds. Woo, that's fantastic. So this is a short survey. Um, so if you are a coordinator, a test coordinator, then take a moment to fill that out, please. So here's some more information. And actually, oh my Lord. Jody, I put the other slides in and they didn't get copied over into this one of the chart that you sent out today. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Do you want me to share my screen, Leora? That, do you have the chart right there that you can show? I do. Oh, that would be so helpful. Okay. This is an example of working on two different documents and not everything gets saved over. So I'm just okay. going to go ahead and share my screen. Thank you for being patient. Best laid plans. Can someone confirm that you can see spring 2023 yes. timeline in yellow? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I'm taking over here, right, Leora? Yes. Okay, great. So for those of you who have already completed the test coordinator survey, um, or maybe perhaps your special ed director has completed it or associate director. Um, this email went out earlier today and it includes a list of the pre-administrative actions for test coordinators or TCs and T test administrators or TAs. So here you can see from January to February, we're looking for test coordinators to complete the survey. Many of you have already done that. So far, Lior, we have 102 responses, so that's really positive. Nice. Um, to review the test coordinator user guide, and the link is included in the final column um, in the email that went out this morning. Review the test administration manual. So again, these are actions that can be taken now. You don't need to wait for the platform to be open to users. These are posted on our main DOE MSAA website, and I'll put that link right here in the chat. Okay, and continuing on, one of the most important things, really the most important thing to do um, is to confirm that all of your students who have been found eligible for alternate assessments via the IEP team process have the alternate flag checked in their Synergy Special Education Record. We use those special education records to create the student accounts in the MSA platform. So if a student, for example, has a local enrollment with alternate assessment checked and 
the district did not complete the upload to Synergy, they're not going to be in the assessment platform because they're not enrolled from a state perspective as an alternate assessment participant. So that's really important. Test coordinators should also be thinking now about who the test administrators for each student are going to be. It should be a familiar professional adult who works with the student regularly and has a lot of familiarity with their IEP. I've been asked before, can ed, ed techs um, serve as test administrators? The answer to that question is yes, they can. Also ensure that each test administrator has made a plan in their instructional schedule to utilize sample items. So MSAA sample items provide our students who participate in alternate assessments the opportunity to get familiar with the platform, to see the kinds of items and graphics that they'll see during the operational assessment, and to practice using any accessibility features that they may need during the assessment, such as highlighter or the Zoom function, or if the student has unique accommodations. So sample items are a very important part of making sure that this population of students have an equitable opportunity to participate. Test administrator responsibilities. So these are the folks who actually administer the assessment with students. Please spend the time now reviewing the test administrator user guide. You should also be reviewing the test administration manual and making a plan to administer, again, those sample items with eligible students. So February 21st, the user accounts for test coordinators will go live in the MSA platform. You will receive a welcome email from the MSA platform with your login instructions, helping you to reset your password. This can only happen if you have completed the test coordinator survey. Otherwise, I don't know who you are. And so I wasn't able to set up an account for you. So if you're a test administrator, it would be good to check with your special education director if someone has been identified as test coordinator for your SAU and that they are, have completed that survey. The first thing that you'll probably wanna do as test coordinator when your account goes live is to go into the platform and check that all of the students you expect to see are in the platform. If they are not, there is an enrollment issue uh, and we need to connect to confirm that first, alternate assessment has been designated in the student's IEP, and second, that they have been enrolled accurately. Nine times out of 10, if they're not in the platform, it's an enrollment issue, um, and you will need to reach out to me directly um, if that happens. For test administrators, TAs, if your test coordinator has chosen to have main DOE set up the accounts for your district, your accounts will also go live on that day. Otherwise, they selected to create the accounts themselves and your account would go live as soon as they've completed that task. So if you don't have a welcome email on February 21st, I encourage you to reach out to your local test coordinator. On February 27th, we will have the online training modules in the MSA platform go live. The modules in the platform are mandatory. All TCs are required to complete these every year. For test coordinators, there is no quiz. For test administrators, they are also required to complete the TA modules every year. And there is a quiz that they need to obtain a passing score on. Every year I get the question, why do we have to retrain every year for this assessment? The answer to that is because despite the fact that we receive a lot of feedback um, about the training requirement, every year we continue to have issues with test administration, testing irregularities, and um, situations where even a student's results might be in question of being invalidated, right? This is a highly nuanced assessment. It is an accommodated form, which we, Leora will talk more about later when we touch on assessment design. And because of those nuances, yes, a lot of the training module components may be familiar to you, but there are also updates each year 
And as we only administer it once a year, it's, a, it's an important step to make sure our TCs and TAs are re-familiarizing themselves with how this assessment is administered. Oh, I almost said next slide and then I realized it's me. <laughs> so February 27th, also, there is an optional test coordinator training facilitated by Maine DOE. So me and possibly Leora. This is optional. Test coordinators are not required to attend. We are not tracking attendance. I will say that the optional Maine DOE session includes some state specific information, which is important to have. There's also the opportunity to ask questions from a live presenter. So if you're interested in attending, please register using the link that was provided in the email. Also on March 1st, there is an optional test administrator training, which is also facilitated by me and or with the special guest star, Leora. <laughs> this again is not required. The required trainings are those in the platform. This is an optional training, but it is encouraged for new test administrators. So. If you are a new test administrator or a test administrator who feels like you want extra preparation, please consider registering for the webinar on March 1st. These sessions will be recorded and so they will be available for viewing afterwards. And then February 27th to March 13th is really the lead up to the assessment window. You want to confirm that all test administrator, as test coordinator, you want to confirm that all TAs have completed the test security agreement, training modules, and the quiz. You'll be able to see that right under users when you log into the platform. Confirm that all of your TAs have reviewed the directions for the test administration. Confer with your TAs to make sure you've developed a local schedule for participation to make sure every student has the opportunity to participate and hopefully building in time at the end of the window for makeups and absences. And ensure that if your TAs have printed off materials from the platform, that there is a secure location where those materials are being kept when not in use. And for TAs during that two weeks, we really focus on completing those online training modules in the platform and passing the quiz and reviewing the directions for test administration. The directions for test administration are different for different sessions and different grade levels. There are always resource sheets that need to be printed off and sometimes cut out that accompany the assessment items. And for students who are blind or have a visual impairment, there might be the need to develop tactile graphics to go along with certain items. Because of these reasons, these are not test directions you can just print off five minutes before the test and, and it's go time. You really do need the time to review in advance, make sure your materials are organized, and that you're comfortable administering the assessment. Okay, I think this is still me. Is that right, Leora? It is, yep. Did you want me to switch back to your PowerPoint or we should do that after I'm through? Why don't we do that after you're through? Okay, so I wanna go into a little bit the federal requirements around alternate assessments based on alternate academic achievement standards. So, we're capturing some language in these next few slides from both the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the reauthorization of ESEA, which happened in 2015, as well as we're going to include some of the language from IDEA. So a state must provide alternate assessments aligned to the challenging state academic standards and alternate academic achievement standards for students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. And we're gonna delve a little more into that with this next slide. So we are federally required to provide the opportunity for all students, including students with disabilities, students who are multilingual learners with disabilities and students with the most significant cognitive disabilities to work towards grade level standards. For students with the most significant cognitive disabilities, they may be eligible for an alternate assessment. No more than 1% of students in the assessed grades in the whole state can participate in an alternate assessment. 
And another requirement is that the parents as members of the IEP team are informed as part of that process that their student will be participating in an alternate assessment. So I get a lot of questions often around why these students participate in an alternate assessment. Some educators have expressed feeling that it's too rigorous for this population of students. Others have maybe struggled with interpreting the eligibility requirements. We are federally required to continue supporting students with the most significant cognitive disabilities towards grade level expectations. As you know, that's pretty rigorous for many students within this subpopulation. The alternate assessments are designed on alternate academic achievement standards. These are derived from our state grade level standards, but they are smaller, more accessible chunks, reduced significantly in depth and complexity to help our students with the most significant cognitive disabilities have manageable steps towards continuing to reach for that grade level content. Here's some of the language under IDEA. So we must ensure that our alternate assessments are aligned to the state's academic content standards and that they're challenging student academic achievement standards. Again, the way that we accomplish this is by having an alternate assessment based on those alternate academic achievement standards, which have been derived and are linked to our state grade level standards. One thing which we do every year, which is also federally required, is the SEA is asked to provide oversight to our local education system. So in Maine, those are the SAUs around 1% participation. How that works in Maine is Leora and I and other members of the Aussie team take a look at the participation of eligible students from spring 2022. It is important that all students have the opportunity to be assessed. It's not only a federal requirement, it's also a critical part of educational equity because assessment data is used in our state's accountability model. If our students with significant cognitive disabilities are not participating, they are not being represented in accountability. And that is an equity issue. All students need to participate in state assessments including students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. Another thing that we look at is the 1% calculation locally. So districts which exceed the 1% cap. And we reach out to districts to make sure that they're aware of their current percentages and see if they need any support in examining their goals in terms of alternate assessment participation. As a state, Maine had 0.76 alternate assessment participation in the spring of 2022. So as a state, we came in under the 1% cap. I'm gonna pass it over to Leora <laughs> now because she's going to get into some of the eligibility criteria. I do have to leave the meeting. I'm actually in an MSA planning meeting right now with our other state partners. I just wanna reiterate, that technical assistance is available to all main SAUs. The assessment team would be more than happy to meet with you and connect with you around your needs. Um, and please do not hesitate to ever reach out. Thank you, Jody. We appreciate you stepping out and, and coming to share with us. All right, I am gonna pull this back up and Oh Lord, of course I pressed from the beginning. Okay, let me get to the wrong slide. Here we go. Okay, so when we're talking about the 1% of the population that would take the 
alternate assessment, part of the participation decision flow chart is looking at whether or not the child has a significant cognitive disability. So this is a student who has been identified with one or more of the categories of disability under IDEA and displays an intellectual functioning much below the average student that exists parallel to significant deficits in adaptive behavior. Students with significant cognitive disability require extensive instruction with goals and objectives connected to means alternate academic achievement standards. So when we are reviewing um, action plans for, action plans are another part of the 1% process. So if a district is over 1% for participation, then there is a review committee made up of Jody and myself and two other um, folks from the Maine Department of Education. The districts are required to fill out an action plan to talk about why they're over the 1%. And Maine is a state where it is not uncommon to be over 1% just based on the child count of your district. So we definitely see that. Um, and there's there's not much a district can do about that. But one, one of the questions on the action plan is asking what disability categories are represented by the 1% population in your district. Generally speaking, a significant cognitive disability, um, the child would be identified with an intellectual disability um, or with autism, for example, um, or it could be as part of a multiple disability. So those are really uh, most often the disability categories that are um, that the 1%, the, the most significant cognitively um, disabled uh, children, uh, students um, would have in Maine. And I do not know what has just happened to my words, but hopefully they'll come back soon. Okay. So the participation decision document. We get a lot of questions about this document, and there is an a version that's a little bit, I think a little bit easier to look at as a visual that I'm gonna show in a couple of slides. But this is this guides the IEP team through the decision-making process to see whether a child actually qualifies as that 1% of the population. So you can see that there are questions in the left-hand column with either yes or no. And then in the middle column, it's really about what, what does that look like for that child? Where did that information come from? Um, what, what are the supports that that particular student needs in order to be successful? And then you can see that the third column on the right is really looking at what artifacts were used by the IEP team to make that decision to qualify the child. So we have an example. So here's just an example of the first question. So does the student have a significant cognitive disability? The answer to this was yes. And the artifacts that were used to make this decision were, inform were formal and informal tests, like achievement tests, psychological reports, like a Wyatt or a WISC, or a Vineland, for example, adaptive behavior assessment. So those are just some examples. But you can see that the, the sources of evidence are there for you to check off. So you're not needing to, um, you know, rustle around through files, et cetera, but actually having those data points ready so the team can really talk about them and make an informed decision is, is probably best practice. So these are the disability categories um, that IDEA um, you know, has us use. But again, when we're looking at the children with the most significant cognitive impairments, it would be primarily intellectual disability, autism, or multiple disabilities. But there are certainly, as part of those multiples, could be other disabilities involved. So if we look at question two, um, the student is learning content linked to derived from the Common Core State Standards, and Maine has just switched to the Maine learning results. Um, hopefully that you're aware of that. 
um, and the alternative academic achievement standards that are required to be cited for a child who takes the alternate assessment. Again, like Jody just explained, are smaller chunks. They're aligned with the main learning results, but they're smaller. They're reduced in complexity so that the student still has the opportunity to work on grade level um, standards, but they're of um, you know, a, a smaller complexity than their peers. So if we're looking at the the student learning content linked to those alternate academic achievement standards, we would look at work samples, progress monitoring data, any RTI that's going on, and then of course at their present levels of academic and functional performance. So again, you can see that there are check boxes there with um, examples that you could use to make the determination for this question. So the next question is about the student requiring extensive direct individualized instruction and substantial supports to achieve measurable gains in the grade and age appropriate curriculum. That's a lot of information, but what this really is saying is, does this child need to have their educational materials significantly adaptive and individualized in order to be able to access their learning? So what we would be looking at if you were an IEP team, it would be the work samples, data from whatever uh, progress monitoring that's going on, um, any checklists that you may be using in the classroom, and then of course those present levels of academic and functional performance, their goals and objectives from their current IEP. So the IEP should be um, looking at some information to determine whether the alternate assessment is appropriate for the individual student. So this is just some additional guidance that IEP teams should be looking at. The first is a description of the student's curriculum and instruction, including data on progress. Their work samples and data, examples of performance on assessment tasks to compare with their classroom work. Results from their um, previous alternate assessments, or from individualized reading assessments. And then from the IEP present levels, um, that's one of the reasons that we talk as a team about objective data-driven information, because that information is used to inform so many different pieces of the student's programming. Um, considerations for students with individualized and substantial communication needs uh, or modes. So, Remember that our, our students who use communicative devices, um, you know, we would be looking at that information as well. And then, of course, a student who may be a multilingual learner, they would be taking the access, which is, um, of course, the alternate for um, MLLs. So that would be something that they would be, they would be participating in. And this is what I was talking about. Jody made this last year. It's sort of a simplified, a simplified version of the participation decision flow chart. And you can see it's missing some information, right? It doesn't have the column with the check boxes and it doesn't have, you know, the middle column with that additional information. But this is super easy to look at and see, um, you know, where that decision is leading you. So I would encourage you if you're somebody who participates in these conversations, you know, have a couple of these at the table so that folks who are, you know, making the decisions about whether or not the child qualifies for the alternate assessment have this resource available to them so they can really understand what the team is referring to as you go through those questions as a team. From an IEP standpoint, we look for compliance in 6B of the IEP as related to the um, alternate assessment. And you can see this particular example is a child who qualifies for the alternate. We've put, we've checked yes, and then we included an, explana an explanation of how the team came to that decision. 
So the IEP team used the participation decision flow chart, oops, sorry about that, um, to determine that given the student's need for extensively adapted materials and consistently high levels of support, the alternate assessment is the correct choice. So we referred to the participation decision flow chart, so there's no question about the IEP team um, using that resource to guide the discussion, but also we made sure to include the fact that the child's materials are extremely adapted. They're not using the same curriculum um, as their peers. So if we're just looking for a, for a compliance standpoint, this section of the IEP can't be blank. And if the child does qualify for the alternate assessment, their academic goals require objectives. And I have an example of that in just a few slides. So the procedural manual speaks to alternate assessment on pages 29 to 31. Um, it actually gives the example of the participation decision flowchart, the, the older version that I went through a couple of the questions on. Um, but there's also additional guidance here if you would like to see it. There it is, it's on page 29. So, if the IEP team determines that the child is going to take the alternate assessment, then that's why we have to put the statement of why the child can't participate in regular general assessments in 6B of the IEP. That statement is actually a MUSER requirement. So this is a um, just a snippet from the website for assessments, and you can see that if you go to the website, there are some different um, there are some different drop downs that you can open up. So this is the preparing for the assessment piece of that. So there's the overview of the one percent training video, an overview um, of the training PDF. If you'd rather look at the PDF rather than watch the video, there is a webinar about the alternate academic achievement standards, and there's also the PDF for that. And then there's the core content correct connectors, which are also the um, academic, the alternate academic achievement standards. And this is another one of the drop downs. And you can see that these are the test manuals that we were mentioning earlier today that have been released. So they are up on the website now. And there was um, a training presentation from March 2021. That's a good resource to look at. And that is linked there as well. So the alternate academic achievement standards are those are the, um, the standards that we cite the academic goals to uh, the, and the academic objectives for the students who take the alternate assessment. They don't replace grade level standards, but they serve as smaller steps to support this, the student population in, assess, in accessing grade level content. So they're aligned to the state academic content standards at grade level. They provide access points to the general curriculum because they're aligned. They are the highest possible standard. So when you're looking, you know, when you are looking for what standard to cite to your goals, you want to start with the highest that you think that child could attain and then work your way down. We want to assume competence. Um, this speaks to that inclusion piece that Jody was just mentioning about our accountability systems. And these alternate academic achievement standards also help the, um, the alternate students make sure that their post-secondary education is, is, is aligned and will help them find, um, hopefully, competitive workforce opportunities um, if that is possible. All right, and this just talked, this is the citation that talks about why we use the alternate academic achievement standards. And there is the link to where they are found on the website, on the MainTube e website. And here's an example of an IEP with the citation. So we have Lily. 
Um, and the goal is that by November 10th, she, given SDI and reading strategy, she'll participate in conversation and express her own ideas in eight of ten out of eight out of ten opportunities. So you can have as many objectives as you want. For this example, I just did two, and you can see that I just broke down the goal into smaller chunks. So the present level is that she can currently do this five out of ten opportunities. So within a year, we want her to get to eight out of 10. That's what the team feels like is reasonable for Lily. So the first objective is that three months after her annual, we'll have her at six out of 10 opportunities. And then the next example is three months after that. In May, we're going to be able to have Lily at seven out of 10 opportunities. So it's the same as the goal, it's just broken down into a smaller chunk. And there is the citation. So when we're monitoring for um, things related to the alternate assessment on the electronic monitoring tool, we have two different potential findings that could be on a corrective action plan. The first one is just simply making sure that section 6B of the IEP is not blank. That's it. Is yes, no, or NA checked. As long as it's not blank, 100% compliant. The next one is if it is checked, yes, that the child does take the alternate assessment, that their academic goals have objectives. So that's that second piece that we monitor for now. Um, last year was the first time we monitored 6B um, for the alternate, and we added the objective piece this year. So this is fairly new um, in the monitoring system, in the monitoring process, um, but it's because we have been working so closely with the assessment team and we really want to ensure that our students who have the most significant cognitive disabilities have the same access as their general education peers do. So this is just a little bit more information about um, the alternate academic achievement standards. So Oops, pardon me. This is about the alternate assessment. So it was developed to ensure that all students with significant cognitive disabilities are able to participate in assessment to measure what they know and can do in relation to the grade level content. That's why there's an alternate assessment that plays right back into that legislative information that Jody was talking about with ESSA and with IDEA in the beginning of today's webinar. So when we're talking about highly accommodated, we would be looking at a one-to-one -one setting. The test can be read aloud to the student. You can repeat any of the elements. There's item complexity at levels one, two, and three, and the, um, the assessment itself builds on itself, right? So if you've if you've administered the assessment before, you know that um, you know it builds on itself. It gets more challenging the more um, you know correct answers that the student has, and there are there is a range of embedded embedded accessibility features. And this is just such a little overview. When you go to the test coordinator or the test administrator training, this will be um, gone over in much more minute detail than we're doing right now with this quick overview. So there are two sessions for each content area. The ELA and mathematics are stage adaptives, routing the student to form 2A, 2B, or 2C for a second session. So that's what I was talking about. It builds on itself. Um, the students can complete an entire session or several items in a sitting. And the use of regular instructional supports, such as manipulatives or token boards, is encouraged. So whatever accommodations the child already has on their IEP, they can use for the alternate assessment. And it's important that they do use for the alternate assessment because those are ways that that child, that the IEP team has decided that will help the child access FAPE. So they need to have, um, you know, access to their accommodations that they're familiar use, familiar with using uh, in the classroom setting. And Jody talked as well about, um, if at all possible, ensuring that the person administering the test is familiar to the student. 
So here's a couple of examples. So these were released items from two years ago, I think. So, um, you know, this item is was released by MSAA. So we have item three. We're going to read part of the story again and listen for who Tony was. So it gives very um, detailed instructions for what needs to be read, right? And then what you read to the student. And then there's different um, options that the child has. Was Tony a cook or was Tony a friend? And if you want to read the question again, you absolutely can. And you can ask the student if they would like you to read this the question again or if they're ready to answer. And they can use whatever mode of communication they use on a daily basis to interact with you and answer these questions during the assessment. So here's another example. So you can see that it says item 12, and this is, you know, this is what you're going to be reading to the student. Um, and this particular one is asking the student to use some context clues from this little um, blurb about what the word drift means, and then answer um, the question, point to the visual, however that student is able to answer. So those are the examples that we have, because like I said, Jody is going to go through this in much more detail during the test coordinator and the test administrator training. This was really just meant to be sort of an introduction to why we do the alternate assessment and what are the requirements related to it. Um, before I get into questions, I just want to let you know, Carly, pay attention to make sure I say this right, please. Um, this is a QR code. We really want your feedback. We want you to we want you to tell us what is helpful about our professional development and what could be improved. This will also lead you to a contact hour and you will get all sorts of what I call party favors. Other people might disagree, but you'll get MUSAR, the Maine Unified Special Education Regulations. You'll get the IEP quick reference sheet. You'll get your contact hour. You'll get the procedural manual. You'll get all sorts of fun things. So please just take a minute and please make sure that when it asks you for your email, type it in correctly because it's not going to send you your party favors if you type in an incorrect address. And next are the slides that we include in all of our PD because it's really important information. So you can see the links for our professional development calendar, all of our other recordings and PowerPoints, special education resources, all the laws and regulation, the forms and reporting, and then the guidance on, on required documentation for main care is listed there as well. And here is our office hour. So here we are in alternate assessment. You guys look at our next one on 2-8. We're in the next column of this entire office hour schedule. That's crazy. Did that just sneak up on me? Or am I like, like getting to the next column is like, whoa, so much time has gone by. Um, okay. So here is Jody and my. Uh, contact information. And then here's all of our contact information. So does anyone have any questions on anything that we went over today? I, hi, it's Jen. Hi. <laughs> um, I noted the, um, the slides that were in the thing were different than the slides that you went over. Yes. There were some missing. Yes, Is that they were. Gonna, gonna be is that on purpose or can I get those? It was not on purpose and you can get those. If Excellent. you would like to, this is, if ever this happens that the slides are different, it's almost always my fault, just so you know, <laughs> because I am the person who is working on the PowerPoint. I was changing things at like 220. So it is 100% okay, me. Awesome. Just go ahead and put your, if you want the one with all the slides in it, just put your um, name in the chat box and I'll take a note of it. I'm going to have to combine a couple of things. So it might not be until tomorrow, but I'll get you all the slides together. Thank you. You got it. Anybody else who wants that, just do the same thing and I'm happy to do it. This is my first time doing the alternate assessments and, and being a part of this. So I'm really anxious to make sure that, you know, I get all of the information and that. Uh-huh. 
And Jody is Thanks. such a good resource. Like she, she really is. She really is. Awesome. All right. So I Thank think you. I can go into, I think I can go into, uh, Julie can help me out with the registration with the emails too, to see, to get people's. And Laura, I'm just going to add a quick comment because um, when we share our um, resources, the PD calendar link is up there. And I just wanted to throw out there that the PD calendar has been wonky lately. So if ever you try to go out to the PD calendar to get some information and you find it difficult to find it or you can't find what you're looking for or you can't open it, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to know what will happen. Just send me an email. Uh, my contact information was um, at the end of the presentation too, and I can get you what you need. Oh, and there was one question in the chat box. Is name through your assessment replacing? No, it is not. It is not replacing the new EA spring assessment. Um, are we having up? Yes, we are. From 11.30 to 12, you can join us for office hours on Friday. Um, we encourage you to bring um, questions and um, issues that we can help you with. Otherwise, it'd be kind of just say hi and wave. Colette, did you want to say anything? No, I was just going to joke that Jen could probably run our office hours on Friday. <laughs> where, where, I'm where, here if you need me. I know, I know. We got to start giving you some some work to do since you're here all the time. You've got this down pat. We're actually yes. thinking about next year, maybe offering, and this is a good segue to, to, to just have this conversation, next, potentially having the Friday office hours more open so that people can connect with each other. So like if you're a behavior teacher, for example, and you want to connect with other behavior teachers, you know, just we could facilitate it and provide the forum to let you do that. But we're just kind of playing around with that. So that's something that you think might be helpful just put a note in chat because we're just trying to trying to figure that out as well. I love that. Oh, good. Our honorary team member. Thank you guys so much for being patient with our little, well, my little technical difficulty with the PowerPoint. Um, I will um, get together with Julie and get all of your email addresses and you'll get all of those um, from your registration link. Thank you right. so much, everyone. Stay safe. We're supposed to get hit with snow again. So yeah, it's snowing here in Lewiston. It has yeah. been for a while. Oh boy. Take care, everyone. Thank All you. Right, thanks. Thank you. Bye, everybody.